everyone. Um, welcome to Human Centered Design Global Entrepreneurship Week. Is this the first? first yes. One? So we're Woo. kicking it off. Yeah, I will start by saying up until 15 minutes ago, I thought we were doing this virtually. So I want to apologize. It's horrible presentation skills to have printed PowerPoint notes, but I wasn't prepared to do this in front of people. Um, I'm Claire Schreffer. I am the Director of Community Programs of, with ICCEW. Um, my co-facilitator was going to be Cassandra Rigsby. She is in Norman because we thought this was virtual. So <laughs> she is up here. Um, and we, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about ICCEW and what we do. Um, we are the Ronnie K. E. Ronnie Center for Creation of Economic Wealth. So. Um, ICCEW for short, we are under the University of Oklahoma Price College of Business. Um, and we're broken down um, kind of into several different areas. We have university programs and community programs um, and, and do several things. So the first thing that we really focus on, one of our goals is to launch ideas, team-based approaches. We do consulting for entrepreneurs, small businesses, startups, team-based consulting. That is free if you're interested, always looking for projects. Um, and those programs that we have are programs like The Mine, um, Agile Product Design, Oklahoma Funding Accelerator. Um, and that is groups of young professionals who support those entrepreneurs to work on those projects, ambiguous problems, big ideas. And, sorry. Um, uh, then we also work on building community. So we have community programs like TEDxOU, OK Coders, Oklahoma Wonder Grant, where we have specialized community programs and events um, to support entrepreneurs. Building wealth in the state of Oklahoma is kind of our overarching primary goal. Um, if you want more information, we do have a website. I can also send you my contact information, ICCEW. Um, so we use human centered design as our primary method of consulting and problem solving at ICCEW. Um, so we're going to talk about that here today. Uh, we'll, we'll leave, we've divided the session kind of into four principles. The first is identifying the problem. The second is ideating the solution. The third is testing a pilot. And the fourth is communicating a vision. So you think of the problem, think of ways to solve it try out some of those ways, and then communicate that out to stakeholders. Um, we'll, we'll look at that problem solution process kind of with a greater understanding of your ideas and human-centered design. You'll leave with some tools for identifying and solving the problems that you see. And you'll also leave with a community of people here. Um, stick around, network around 36 degrees if you, if you aren't familiar with the space, if you're just here for today. Um, and something that we, we always kind of like to highlight before we start talking about human-centered design is that it, it's, it's about innovation. It's about having an idea and coming up with creative new ways to do that. And that is really difficult. Um, so there is a trade-off between success and risk. Um, you're going to fail. We always say fail forward. Um, just understanding that, but then also understanding that we're, we try to be really attached to the problem um, versus the solution. So really putting a focus on what the problem is versus what the solution is. Sorry, I told you this is going to be clunky. <laughs> so what is human-centered design? Um, human-centered design is a process, it's a framework to structure problem solving. Um, we think of ourselves a lot of times um, as the hero in a problem. Uh, and so um, we want to frame our problem and, and, and our solutions um, around our experiences. It's really thinking of the person first. So once you've identified the problem, you know that you're focusing around the people that you are solving that problem for versus what your solution is as a, as a person. Um, the people who face those problems are the people who have the key to your answer. So they something that we like to focus on when you're thinking around human-centered design and people is putting a really strong empathy, emphasis, sorry, on failure or on empathy, learning from failure, embracing ambiguity, and iterating. So you want to um, be entrepreneurial, fail fast, like I said, learn really quickly, and iterate through those solutions and those processes. We break human-centered design up into three kind of main pillars: um, inspiration, ideation, and implementation. 
We start with inspiration by defining the problem. So what is the problem that you're trying to solve? And then looking at your customer and your market to get a better understanding of how to work with the people who face that problem every day. And then we move into ideation, where you focus on brainstorming, benchmarking. So brainstorming different solutions for the problem, benchmarking around other businesses who might have faced the same problems as you. Prototyping, trying out some of those solutions, those ideas, and then collecting user feedback from that prototyping. And then you'll move into implementation, where you really will um, develop an MVP, an actual product that you're distributing into the market. That's your implementation. Making sure I'm following this the way that she planned. Yeah. So starting with inspiration, we're looking at framing your problem. To start, you want to frame your problem as a design question. Um, a question stem that we like to use a lot is how might we. Um, how implies an action. Might implies that there are feasible solutions. And then we implies that it's a collaborative process. So if you're thinking of any problem that you have, I'll give an example um, of a project that we worked on several years ago at ICCW. Uh, Students were, well, let me start, our client was social service network. So they were finding often that teens were not arriving for their social service appointments. That was the problem. How might we solve the problem and make sure more teens are getting to their social service appointments? Then you wanna state the goal. The goal is to get those teens to the appointments. You wanna be specific. Um, we don't necessarily know why they're not going. We haven't like gone straight into the customer yet or plan for that, but um, we wanna be specific about what we're trying to solve. And then what are some possible solutions? Staying married to that problem. So an example would be, um, if you know the problem is how might we solve for teens arriving at their social service appointments, you could veer away from that and say, how might we support more families to get more social service appointments? Well, it's not really the problem. The problem is that they already have the appointments and teens are not going. So staying married to that problem. Focusing on the context and constraints that you're facing, um, geographic, based around time, and then phrasing your original question again. I think that's where I want to stop. <laughs> um, and one way to do that, this is the human centered piece, is by using an empathy map or a customer archetype. This is about understanding your users. So you have a lot of customers in this place. So the, the example that I'm using is teens on arriving to the social service appointment. Examples for customers in that space are the teams. They're the social workers. They're the families. They're the teachers who support those teens. They're the whatever, caseworkers, whatever. Um, so completing an empathy map or a customer archetype map can help you frame your problem around that person. So we start by looking at um, what do they think and feel? Let's, let's use the teens as, as an example for a customer. Um, what really counts to them? What are their preoccupations, worries, aspirations? What are they thinking and feeling around these social service appointments? We learned one thing that they were thinking and feeling was that they don't have transportation. Um, to the appointments. The reason they don't have transportation is not because it isn't available to them. They don't like riding alone. So let's say they had Tulsa Transit as an option. They don't like going on that bus by themselves without a friend. That's something they're feeling. Um, what are their friends saying? What are their boss saying? What are their influencers saying? What are they hearing about going to their appointments? Probably a lot of criticism about not showing up without anybody asking them why. What are they seeing? Um, in terms of not going, staying and doing, paying, gain, um, just thinking around a whole map of your user to understand that end user and what they're experiencing. What are their pain points? I think a lot of times we say customer when thinking of human-centered design and, and solving for a problem, but it's probably a lot more accurate to say stakeholder because it's not necessarily, you can use human-centered design in all sorts of work, we work a lot in ICCW and social impact projects. We don't necessarily have customers. We don't necessarily have somebody purchasing a product, um, but we do have so many stakeholders around all of those environments and all of those projects. Um, and it can also be valuable. I think this type of 
tool, this type of empathy map can be valuable even when you're not starting a new thing. So for example, you're a team leader in an organization, you could use this method um, as a team leader to understand what your colleagues are thinking and feeling, what your staff is feeling. But say you're an entrepreneur, not necessarily an entrepreneur, and you need an opportunity to understand why people aren't plugged in at your meetings, why people are not engaging. Using something like a customer archetype map would be really helpful for that. There are a lot of different players in the ecosystem. It's really common, I think, to um, think of you as the person with the idea, you as the entrepreneur, you as the team leader, whomever, and the person that you're providing that service or that product to, and knowing that you have that super duper one of a kind product in the middle. But there are a lot of other players in the system. There are people influencing your customer, your stakeholder. There are people recommending that to them and, and marketing that product for them. People making decisions around that user if the user is not making decisions necessarily for themselves. Whoever is paying for that could be different from the decision maker or the user. All of these people you would want to think about customer archetype maps for. And one really important one that we always point out is the saboteur because there is always going to be somebody who is negative Nancy and is going to try to sabotage that product. Maybe they have a competitive product or something like that. It's really important in human-centered design to think about that negative component as well. And the players you're not considering, really. So that's in identifying your problem. You framed your problem. You thought of some possible solutions, maybe, but we're not quite there yet. And then you thought about your customer. You're really focusing on the human first and foremost. Then we get into ideation, which is brainstorming, benchmarking, prototyping, collecting user feedback like I talked about. And we'll talk about some tools around that. But one thing that we always want to understand is, is when you're getting into ideation, you're thinking of solutions. And we really see innovation happening at the intersection between desirability, feasibility, and viability. Feasibility meaning, can we do it? What's it going to take? Desirability, do people want it? Will they use it? And viability, um, is it financially feasible? And how do we get it to users? Without all of these three, these three things together, it is not our belief that you can innovate. Um, I had a link to drop in the chat. Oh, well. I thought this was pretty cool. <laughs> Um, so, I, yeah, basically thinking of at the intersection of these three things is when you're going to find innovation. Design thinking leads to those solutions, matching human needs, organizational constraints, feasibility. So as you are ideating solutions, um, thinking about those new products. We did get, I will um, call out, we get this idea from a source, from a um, book called Change by Design by Tim Brown, very good book um, about human-centered design. One tool that I imagine everybody has used as a young professional in this world is brainstorming. Um, and we call it out every time because it is one of the most valuable tools you can use in ideating solutions. Brainstorming, um, maybe you've seen it in the form of sticky notes where you just get a whole group together, everybody writes down everything they're thinking on a sticky note, sticks it up on the board. That is brainstorming ideas. You don't wanna do this, um, until you've had your problem defined, like we talked about. But once you have your problem defined, you can you can brainstorm. And we have some specific rules we use at ICCW around brainstorming. One is that quantity is better than quality. So in five minutes, get out every single thing that's on your brain on a piece of paper. It doesn't matter about the quality of that idea. Um, keep going and reserve judgment. So even if you're writing something down and you think this maybe isn't feasible, put it down in the very first step of brainstorming. Building on other ideas, a lot of a lot we say at ICCW is yes and. Where else can you go from that? Building on other ideas, out of the box ideas, and then set a goal and constraints. You could brainstorm forever. Um, so I think it's a really good idea to set maybe a rule of like ten minutes. Everybody write whatever you can in that amount of time, but definitely have some constraints. And making sure you're considering all stakeholders, like we talked about, different scales and scalability, and then out-of-box ideas. 
once you've done that, um, you get into solution brainstorming where you cluster like ideas, evaluate those desirability, viability, feasibility components, um, and cluster them together to put in a two by two. So we use this a lot. Um, it's called a two by two. It's just two axes, four categories where you are sorting your ideas. You can choose what those axes are if you want. Um, but a lot of times that will help you to find that intersection of those three components um, when a lot of your ideas fall into one sort of space of that axis. And then making sure that you are considering feasibility. Can you really do this? What would it really take? And this sh should help you kind of develop a value proposition. Your desired outcome typically from this part of the process of brainstorming and clustering is 10 possible solutions and then that clear value proposition at the end. Another tool we use in the ideation phase is a benchmarking, where you're benchmarking against your competition, other people who have had similar ideas as you. So um, learning about the, the different innovations in your field. When you know what's possible, you can ask the right questions. Um, looking at uh, aligning with your how might we question that you had that you um, developed at the beginning. Um, you don't want to spend time trying to do something that someone else has already worked on um, that you maybe know wasn't the best idea. It's also good to look at, um, to not build, you know, build from scratch. So looking at ideas that already exist, it, it is a good idea maybe in another market. So thinking about um, a, an idea that you have that is really successful in New York and then benchmarking to see would that apply in Oklahoma because it is a different market, it's a different idea. Um, the example I used was like with youth transportation and social services. That is almost absolutely a problem somewhere else regionally. So benchmarking around that competition and seeing what they did as well. And this is an organizational tool that we like to use in benchmarking, um, where you are taking notes as you're learning about these other organizations and these other markets. Um, what, what those organizations are doing, describing those, making a list of some of the best practices, key differences, and their different success metrics. Um, when you organize in a chart like this, you can start to take away some of your answers and proposed solutions based on what you've seen other groups do um, around the environment. Always remembering that desirability, feasibility, and viability space and, in, and how innovation happens at the intersection of those things. And then in the last part of the ideation phase, you want to collect user feedback. So in order to test your solution, you want to define your key questions and the best way to get the answers for those. Don't be afraid to change that up. Invite open and honest feedback for some of those solutions. So as you've benchmarked, as you have brainstormed and put some of those things together, asking users what they think about those ideas. Um, and expecting to be able to have to change from some of those original ideas and adapt on the fly, that's that iterate piece that we talked about. There's also different ways that you can um, prototype and test some of your ideas. So I'll talk about a few of those. Um, four really primary ways. The first is a smoke screen test. Um, it's a low cost, kind of low time sort of test something like uh, taking marketing, creating marketing materials and collecting emails just, just to see if people are interested. That would be like a smoke screen test. Um, Wizard of Oz test is where a customer experiences the end product as you've ideated it, but the work is being done manually behind the scenes. So an example we like to use like this is um, Airbnb when they were very first launching, uh, had their website that was public facing, the user experience was that they would go on, book a house, exactly as you see it today. What was really happening behind the scenes was their team had Excel spreadsheets, available homes, where they are, and, and they were manually matching um, just to see if their process worked. So that's like a Wizard of Oz test. Um, concierge is taking that one step further, so you're actually sitting down with a person and guiding them through the process, asking questions as you go to see what their experience is like. Um, that's often paired with the Wizard of Oz test, just because you likely haven't built out your product or your solution um, completely. 
And then prototype and modeling where you're testing uh, small parts of the solution. So let's say you're building a curriculum for a team. You're, you're, you're maybe um, building out one lesson versus the entire curriculum to see how that goes to test a small piece of the solution. Uh, one example that I like um, that we did, a project that we worked on years ago, um, was a team of students was building a um, lift for a wheelchair so that when you were sitting in the wheelchair, uh, the lift would work to kind of sit you upright so you could reach things in high places. Um, and so to do this prototype and modeling, it doesn't have to be pretty. They wanted to know how high people could go um, before they were uncomfortable, before they felt like they were lifted too high off the ground. So they literally just stacked copies, um, reams of copy paper and sat on them in a chair um, as a team and then noted when they started to feel uncomfortable or a little unsafe and that was how high they made the lift. Um, so it doesn't have to be pretty when you're doing prototyping or modeling. And then you'll communicate the idea. So um, thinking about when you are communicating that idea at the end of ideation, you want to communicate who your, your solution is for, who are your target customers, um, who have the problem, what your product or service is, so what your new sol solution is, what makes you different, what do you provide, what's the key benefit for your target customer, how, do, how are you differentiated? What do you have? And then what are you unlike? So that unlike would be kind of related to that benchmarking that you did. And then you get into implementation. So you started with inspiration, defining the problem, thinking about your customer with your empathy map, ideated some solutions, some tools that we we discussed was um, brainstorming or benchmarking and collecting that user feedback. And then you can implement your product. Um, you can implement your product knowing that you thought of the user first. It was, it was around the human. Um, and you can also use this idea every day. So why do we solve problems this way? We start with defining the problem so that you're sure you're working on the right thing. A lot of times you can think a problem is one thing and what you're working on, what you're focusing on, it actually ends up being something very different. It's a structure for creativity, so that produces better results if you have a structured process and structured tools. And you're integrating user feedback throughout the process to add clarity, focusing on your end customer, focusing on your end user. Um, so using the principles of creativity and design thinking develops a user-centered, implementable solutions to big, ambiguous problems. Um, that is kind of it. I am realizing that I just cruised through that in half an hour. Um, but sorry, again, I was unprepared for this. Um, I did want to list some other resources that, that we like to use. Uh, Change by Design by Tim Brown is a book that we like a lot. IDEO.org is the one to write down if you're gonna write any of these down. It is a website full of tools and resources for human-centered design. So you can plug in um, kind of areas that your problem is around, like uh, kind of focus areas of your problem and they will generate tools for you. That is where we get that customer archetype map for. They have different protocols for brainstorming. Um, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of, of different tools um, for human-centered design. Designkit.org is a similar idea. Um, Design School at Stanford has, has some things that we like. And then we also are offering um, venture strategy session, sessions with ICCW for the remainder of the week um, with the whole team, our whole ICCW team. So we have individuals on staff who've been on staff for 14 years. They have experience um, from McKinsey Group. And you can just sit down with us for 30 minutes. We can talk one on one about your idea and what you've got going on and help you to ideate some solutions around that um, in a less formal, less structured way, just more of a conversation. Um, so that is linked on the, I know it's on the 36 Degrees North website. It's been in some of those emails and I think you can find that information on Facebook as well. Um, do you all have any questions? Yes. How do we get access to the deck? Or will we get access? This deck? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I are there pieces? I think that we could send probably pieces of it if you're interested in those. Um, or maybe some notes. Let me think about that. 
and then we'll figure it out. And did you guys, did you sign up online for the session? Okay, so then we'll probably have your information. Yep. Yes. Uh, thank you, this is great. Sure. Um, so you, you're, you're focusing, like you said, like of all the different stakeholders that you can look at, you wanna make sure that we're developing a profile for each, for each category mm -hmm. of group of people. Um, and if you focus on the end user, I'm just wondering how, so I guess it's like a two-part question, like how do you um, know which human group to like prioritize, right? And then at, like, what is the balance of going and actually talking to people from these groups um, versus, I know like a UX design right now, there's this like, like the audience is, is ever real, like your user's never real because you're just imagining them as you're sitting at your desk sure. anyway. It's so like how much are you balancing like this imaginary stakeholder versus an actual stakeholder and then prioritizing which group you go to? I think there's value in both. Um, and that would really come from the framing of your problem. So I, a lot of times to create these customer archetype maps, those are often created from interviews, actual users. You want to think of your like one use case scenario, your perfect user for your problem, whatever that may be, or for your product. Um, and talk to some people like that if you can. Some of it will also be rooted in assumptions though, and then thinking through when you're ideating some of those solutions, maybe looping back to that archetype map, because some of the solutions you came up with might change that perfect end user. Um, is that answering your question as you were asking, like what the balance is? I, there is so much value in interviews and getting out and talking to people, but we don't always push that because I know that can be hard if you're one person, you're one single entrepreneur with your idea, you don't have a team to kind of help you do that. Hi Jess. Hello. We are um actually oh, I know perfect. this is Jess. She's on staff with me at ICCW. She came when I panicked about facilitating this, but I sure. raised there really quickly. Awesome. Um yeah so does, does that help? Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I at the at the end, so this is kind of going back to the question, like like it's it's gonna be talking to people throughout like doing some customer interviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really um, um Oh, okay. So, like that, like the, the last piece is the, the focus of the communication, mm -hmm. the story of it. Um, how much should you be considering the story, like the overall horizon of what you're trying to do in those ideation moments when you're like doing the, like the, the very first steps? Yeah, I think that the story is going, going to come from that idea. So I don't know that I would put a lot of thought into that end piece, that communication piece, because you'll develop that from what you've ideated and from some of your problems and solutions. Um, if you, but you should consider it in the ways of um, like when you're doing benchmarking and you're wanting to differentiate yourself from other groups or explain how what you're doing is similar, but in a different space in a different context. Um, but it's human centered design is really more about thinking about the people first versus thinking about how you're going to communicate out what you're doing, what your product is. It's way more about the problem and who you're serving than it is how you're going to ultimately at the end market that out to people. Mm, okay. Okay. Do you have something to add to that? Yeah. Okay. We good on mentioning? Any other questions? Okay. Well, I uh, well, I, I apologize for multiple things, but for cruising through this in half an hour, so quickly. Um, I'll be around all day. I'm gonna work here all day. So if you guys are here um, and want to chat or something comes to you later, let me know. Um, like I said, we are offering those venture strategy sessions. Those are in the um, in the notes, and that will be mainly led by my supervisor more and Jess will be there and different people from our team to kind of support you through that. Um, 
there's a lot of value in those sessions, I think, because it's just you and us. So we can really talk through like really specifics of your identified problem of things that you're thinking about um, from people who have substantially more experience than you. So if there's a lot of value in that. I would say highly push you to um, sign up for some of those sessions. We have tons of time. Resources back up. <laughs>